now that I got the bio out of the way, because I can give an extensive bio on this brother that would take me all day, I'm going to give a, uh, a, a quick personal account with, with Michael. Um, my first introduction or reintroduction to this information was with uh, Hidden Colors 2. So once I saw that, it was a completely transformative film for me. I had seen um, John Henry Clark's film years ago, but just being out in the street and doing normal young guy stuff, I kind of lost my way, but uh, Hidden Colors 2 definitely brought it back home for me. So um, after watching it, I would look for as much information as I could find. And when I found out that we had a lecturer that was as powerful as a speaker as Michael M. Hotel, right here in Detroit, I would go see him everywhere he would go. <laughs> so I almost like stalked him for a while. <laughs> and um, in my evolution and in my development, he has brought me along by hosting screenings with me because I'm a film rep for the film Out of Darkness. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Yeah, yeah. And he's, he's hosted several screenings with me. He's um, hosted several programs and events with me. And he's basically showed me the ropes and being professional and passing our information along to our people the right way. So this brother is a fantastic speaker. I'm gonna let him go, let him get busy. And just to let you know, once he starts talking with his hands, he, he done zoned out. You about to really get some good information. So uh, no further, with no further ado, Mike Wynn Hotel. All right, how's everybody doing today? All right, hotel. All right, so uh, I want to thank everybody, first of all, for coming out uh, today. I mean, this place is packed. Uh, Charles, I think we did. Charles and Professor Small, I think we did a really, really good job. So that's right, I mean, that's you give right. yourselves a round of applause for coming out. Uh, how many of you, this is your first time hearing about the Hidden Colors series? How many of you, raise your hand, this is your first time. How many of you, this is your first time seeing Hidden Colors 4? Raise your hand, okay. It's fantastic. Well, out, outside we have uh, Hidden Colors 1, 2, 3, and 4 at my table. We have uh, documentaries, some of my lectures as well. So uh, I really appreciate you all coming out here. I did three radio interviews today. I have Professor Small on two radio interviews on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation. We have my man Ralph Gottby here, who's on, uh, <laughs> on, on Radio Partners. He's on 9, 10 a.m. Uh, Monday through Friday, uh, 9 a.m. to 12 noon, so be sure to check him out. Uh, but what I want to talk about today, I, I did a presentation this Saturday at our Cuba Line Village called uh, The Time We Have Been Waiting For Is Now. Colin Kaepernick, the slave movies, uh, the Black Bank movement, and um, something else, I don't remember what it was. But the, the main, the main, the gist of what I was talking about was the time that we have been waiting for, I think, is now. Because there's an awakening taking place. There's an awakening, if, if, we go, if we go back to the beginning of this year, we had Beyonce doing a, a fabulous performance at the Super Bowl. A Black Panther theme performance. And this brought about an awakening and people talking about this. Then in February, we had hip hop artists like Killer Mike. We had T.I. We had Usher, Jermaine Dupri in Atlanta opening up bank accounts at Citizens Trust Bank. Yeah. There were a lot of articles written about this, focusing on African-American-owned banks and the need to support our own banks just like every other ethnic group does, okay? Then if you go a little bit later to the year, uh, at the BET Awards, we had Jesse Williams from uh, Gray's Anatomy receiving the Humanitarian Award, okay? And, and, talking, and talking about issues, talking about police misconduct, police brutality, things like this. And that brought about an awakening. At the ESPY Awards, you had four uh, uh, NBA players. You had uh, LeBron James, and you had Carmelo Anthony, Dwayne Wade, uh, Chris Paul. They, at the beginning of the uh, uh, award ceremony, they talked about police misconduct, police brutality. That brought about an awakening, okay? You have uh, the Black Bank Movement because of the, uh, uh, it started early this year, but it was heightened July 5th and 6th because of the killings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, yeah, yeah. okay? And then July 7th, you have hip hop artist Killer Mike on 107.9, uh, Hot Hot 107.9 in Atlanta. He was interviewed by uh, Ms. Shanika, and he talked about taking your money out of the white banks, putting your money in African-American-owned banks. And he specifically talked about Citizens Trust Bank in Atlanta. And Citizens Trust Bank, a few days later, they announced that over a five-day period of time, 8,000 new accounts were open at their bank. And they attributed that to Killer Mike. If you, if you go and watch 
the video, it was uh, uh, live streamed on Facebook. When I, the last time I checked it, I checked it about a month ago. We had been viewed over three million times a month ago, okay? Uh, you have banks like manufacturers, uh, manuf uh, 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 mechanics and farmers bank, and I think North Carolina, $1.25 million in new accounts opened up over a, few, uh, over a short period of time. You have uh, industrial, uh, you have a bank in uh, Washington, D.C., um, and it's a commercial bank. They announced August 17th, blackenterprise.com had an article. They announced 1,500 new accounts opened in the month of July. They said that's the same amount of new accounts that are open over a six month period. It was open in one month, $2.7 million in new accounts open. Okay? So I, I want to hit just on a, a couple of, just on a few things here. First of all, anytime I do a presentation, anytime I speak, I know I'm going to say some things that are outside of the conference of some people's awareness. So I usually have a disclaimer. I used to say something like this. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Right. Everything that I think I know about, whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know it that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. Now, the reason why I say that is because oftentimes when we hear something that contradicts what we've been taught, what we believe, or what we think we know, we automatically reject it without doing any research to determine the validity of the new information that we're learning. And at the same time, we usually don't use that same level of scrutiny to analyze, critique, or reevaluate what it is we believe or what we think they, what we think we know. So just because you know everything that you know about what you know does not mean you know everything that is to know about what you know. There's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own work. So usually when I do a presentation, I usually have to spend the first 15 to 20 minutes deprogramming and refuting a lot of the nonsense that has been fed to us about our history. Amen. Okay, see, first and foremost, we were taught that we first came here August 20th, 1619 on that Dutch man of war ship with 20 some odd Africans. It actually was an English warship, number one. Number two, even though it happened, African people have been in this land we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years. We are the indigenous people of this land. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. The Khoisan were here. You had pyramid mounds built up and down the Mississippi River. You had uh, uh, African presence from ancient Kemet here. Okay, you have pyramids built here. So we really have to understand this history. So I, re I refer people to one of my friends, Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. How many people are familiar with Dr. David M. Hotel? Okay, so his book is phenomenal. I've interviewed him a number of times. Uh, I have two radio shows, as Toby said. I have the national radio show, the Michael M. Hotel show, and the pamphlets are coming around with my information, information about my radio show. But all my shows are podcasted at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So we have over 600 podcasts of shows going back to 2010. That's how long I've been doing radio, okay? And all, all these scholars, a lot of them I've interviewed. I've interviewed Professor James Small, who's one of my teachers, a number, a number of times. Dr. Yeah. Leonard Jeffries, yeah. uh, Professor Kawa Hiawatha Kamane, Dr. Frances Crest Wilson, had the pleasure of uh, interviewing her three times yeah. before she made a transition. I've interviewed people like Dr. Richie Keene, who made this uh, the transition, and a lot of other scholars as well. Okay, so Dr. David M. Hotel, in his book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, on page 14, he talks about the African presence in this land, and he, he, he cites evidence found in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear, uh, who's an archeologist at the University of South Carolina. Now, Dr. Albert Goodyear is a European, and he's gotten a lot of flack for telling the truth. But they found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures, footprints and lava, Egyptian writings and tools. He uses 13 different disciplines in his book to fairly document an African presence in this land before Native Americans came into existence. This is the other thing we have to, this is the other thing we have to understand. So when, see, I don't have a problem, I don't ever have Europeans telling me to go back to Africa because they know what I would tell them to go back to because I studied their history and our history. Okay, okay. See, because, because Professor Calvin Kamene is one of my teachers, Dr. John Henry Clark was his master teacher, and Dr. Clark, he told me that Dr. Clark told him, he said, you study European history, I'll teach you African history. Okay. So I study Europeans history and I study our history. So when I'm on the radio, I don't ever have a problem with Europeans calling in acting a fool because I know their history. Okay, it, 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 it would not be pretty. And, and on my blog talk radio show, I had somebody I was interviewing Dr. David M. Hotel one time, and he called in and he wanted to act a fool and call us the N word. 
and I let him talk, and then I said, I'm so glad you took time out of your busy schedule of having sex with your sister to call in and show Ooh. us how uh, equal you can act. So then we went on to actually break down history to show him how he was historically inaccurate. Okay? And then I said, thank you for calling. Have a good day. Because I told him, I said, if we had told people how ignorant you were, then they wouldn't have believed us. But you just proved for the whole world, and that show is still archived to this day. Okay? Now, this is not about hating anybody, but when you present the truth, you have people trying to challenge you. Okay? And don't have a foundation to challenge you on the truth in the first place. Now, so not only are uh, African people indigenous to this land, but we were here before Native Americans came into existence. And you have Asians who come here, you have groups of Africans who come here. Dr. Claude Anderson, another one of my teachers, who's from yeah. Detroit, Dr. Yeah. Claude Anderson. Yeah. He talks about the Folsom people. He was one of the first ones, he was one of the first ones that talked about the Folsom people. And Folsom, Arizona is named after them. Folsom yeah. Prison is named after them. This is another group of African people who were here going back 15, 16,000 years ago. But you have Asians who come here around 3000 BC. They intermix with the Africans who are already here. Their offspring are who we call Native Americans, who we traditionally call Native Americans. And, and I have, uh, if you look at old photographs of Native Americans, old black and white photographs, you see these were darker skinned people, usually high cheekbones. These were not the light, almost white looking Native Americans you have today. Okay? And as Dr. Anderson talks about, he said about 90% of the people today calling themselves Native Americans are actually descendants of Europeans who had their names added to the Dolls Rose in 1887. And this is where you get the $5 Indian from. Because they were trying to redistribute 138 million uh, acres of land. And it was supposed to go to uh, African people and Native Americans and Europeans ended up getting two thirds of that land. That's called an affirmative action program for white people. Okay. All right, now the next myth that we have to dispel and stop lying to our children about is that Columbus never discovered America. Columbus did not discover America, okay? We, we have to get the history and the geography straight, okay? First of all, now a lot of people say, well, you can't discover a land where people already are. Well, that's true, but the number one reason why Columbus did not discover the land we call the United States of America is because Columbus never came to the land we call the United States that's of America. Right. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. This is why a lot of my presentations, like I did this past Saturday, I show you his four voyages where he went. He starts out August 3rd, 1492 on the Nina de in Santa Maria. He goes into uh, San Salvador, what we call the Bahamas. He called it San Salvador, which means Saint Savior, named it after his Savior, quote unquote, Savior Jesus the Christ, but then he becomes a devil to the people and decimates the population. He goes into places like Haiti and Jamaica and Cuba, Puerto Rico. He goes into uh, uh, the Venezuela, the mainland. So he's in Central America, South America, and he's in the Caribbean. He never comes to the land we call the United States of America. So we have to stop lying to our children, telling us why. And also, what happens is when we teach them that, that their history starts in slavery, we're psychologically damaging them because we're teaching them that history. That we're teaching them that their history starts in bondage, as conquered by the descendants of the Europeans who they're taught to go to work for today. Okay. So we we have to understand how damaging this is to our to our children. And I, I talk about the proliferation of slave movies. Now, it's true, slavery is a part of our history, okay? But that's not the only part of our history, even in this country. We've been here at least 51,700 years. We were in South America going back at least 56,000 years. And there's new evidence, Dr. David Emotep, he shared with me an uh, article from the New York Times from uh, last year that uh, pushes this date back 100,000 years. There's evidence showing that we were there 100,000 years ago. We know there was an article from the New York Times uh, back in 2010 called On Crete new evidence of very ancient mariners. This talks about an African presence on the Greek island of Crete 130,000 years ago, and Crete has been an island for five million years. This is not from Infowars.com, this is from the New York Times, that science section. When you actually read the article, it tells you that they thought Mediterranean seafaring dated back 12,000 to 15,000 years ago. But they said this discovery, they did excavations over two summers on the Greek island of Crete and found stone tools that date back 130,000 years ago. We were the only people on earth 130,000 years ago, okay? And, they, and when you actually read it, it said this is causing scientists to have to rethink everything. It's causing them to have to push back the dates of everything. And as Professor Kabbalah, as he said, and other scholars, probably Professor James Small as well, the, the pyramids in ancient Kemet, in ancient Egypt, are much older than what they're telling us they are. All these dates have to be pushed back so the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do the older. All right, 
right now. The, the problem with the slave movies is that it helps keep you in a slave state of mind. That's right. Because you keep you keep showing these movies. You know, 2013 was called the year of the slave themed film because there were seven slave themed movies that came out in 2013. A lot of people don't know this. There were seven slave themed movies that came out in 2013. Okay? Now, I'm not against the Nat Turner movie because th that was a rebellion that we really need to know about. But the next slave movie that they make needs to be about the Haitian Revolution. Because, because that revolution actually worked. Not only did they defeat the French, but they defeated the Spanish and the British and killed 35,000 Europeans in the process. They fought for their freedom. So that's the if you want to make a slave movie, that's the next one to make. But it's hard to get it made because there's no white heroes in the movie. And seriously, because when, Holly, when they're trying to make these movies for Holly Weird or Hollywood, however you want to call it, I call it Holly Weird because there's a lot of weird stuff going on there. But when, when you have movies, historical movies like that, and there's no white heroes, mm -hmm. it's very hard to get that movie made. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is why when they were trying to make the movie Panther, Mario Van Pe uh, uh, Melvin Van Peoples and Mario Van Peoples, right, right, the right. studio actually, actually wanted them to create a white Black Panther. And, and they were like, this, this doesn't exist. They wanted a white black panther so it did a sell more at the box office. Maybe they put Rap Pitt in as a white black panther or Tom Cruise or something like that. Okay? All right. Now, at the foundation of this, I was talking to Professor Small, um, leaving the radio station, headed back to the hotel. The foundation of this is African history and culture. Okay? Professor Small and Dr. Linda Jeffries, they talk about the pyramid principle. Professor Small will probably talk about it. I did what they allow my presentations. The foundation is, is African history and culture. It gives you your VIPs, your values, your interests, okay. and your principles. This is why it doesn't matter how much money you have, if that foundation is not in place, you won't know what to do with the money. Yeah. So our gross domestic product, $1.3 trillion a year, 97% of our dollars spent with people that don't look like us. Right. We went from spending 2% of our dollars to 3% of our dollars with people that don't look like us. That, that is an improvement. <laughs> but you, you, you can never control your economic empowerment until you control your mind. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you is based upon what you think about yourself. Yeah, right. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay? So this is why the history is so important. And then once you control your, once you have control of your mind and then control the economics in your community, you own the businesses, on the land, on the gas stations, the grocery stores, uh, you own the, the, the TV stations, the, uh, the radio stations, the newspapers, the car washes, things like this, then you can control the politics in your community. Okay? But until we get control of our minds and take our minds back from our oppressor, we will never be able to control our economics or politics. Okay? And, in the, in the three minutes, in the three minutes I have remaining, I, I want to say this very quickly. Um, there's a study called the Ever Growing Gap that came out last month. I talked about this a lot on my shows. I went through, read a lot of the studies. A 39-page study. It deals with the wealth gap. What this study uh, accurately details is that it would take the average African American family 228 years to achieve the same level of wealth that the average white family has today. And they, and they clearly state that this is based upon past and current public policies. So one of the things we have to understand and understand in history is, is how wealth was maldistributed into the hands of the dominant white society. Okay, 246 years of slavery, decades of the black holes, decades of Jim Crow segregation, forced sharecropping, uh, uh, forced convict leasing system, uh, um, and then also when the unions are created, they're created to lock African Americans out of those jobs we were doing for free during slavery. There were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that we had in this country from 1619 to 1865. We dominated the skilled trades. Don't take my word for it. Right here in this museum, when you go through the replica of the slave ship here, you go through the main display, you come out on the other side. When you go through, you pass Harriet Tubman and things like this. They have a they have a plaque on the wall. And it's from the book called The Other Slaves by James Newton, 1978. And they list 262 skills, trades, and crafts we had in this country. Now, it's not numbered. Okay, the reason why I know that 262 is because there was a sign there that said you can't take pictures. So I spent an hour writing them down. And then I know. That's how I know that 262. Okay? So 
August 23rd, of last, uh, August 23rd of last month was known as African American Women's Equal Pay Day. Mm. Does anybody know why? The reason why is because African American women make 63, the average African American woman makes 63 cents for every dollar that the average white male makes. And it takes the average African American woman until August 23rd of the next year to make the same amount of money that the average white male made from January 1st to December 31st of the previous year. That's why August 23rd was called African American Women's Equal Pay Day. Okay, bringing more attention to the equal pay gap. So, in closing, um, we have to deal with reclaiming our minds. That's right. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, what you allow other people to do to you is based upon what you think about yourself. Um, blocking out a lot of the nonsense that's fed to us, love and hip hop, empire, all types of things like this, Real Housewives of Atlanta. Yeah. You know, Dr. Little Jeffries talks about how Whoever controls the images, controls the self-esteem, the self-development, the self-worth of the people. Whoever controls the history, controls the vision, okay? okay. Then we have to understand and, and expose ourselves to information like AtlantaBlackStar.com, YoBlackWorld.net, FinancialJuneteenth.com, mm. Black, Black Enterprise, etc. that reprograms our mind to focus on economic empowerment and controlling the politics in our community as well, okay? And then lastly, one of the biggest things we can do is what Dr. King said in his last speech. He said, I call upon you to take your money out of the banks downtown and put your money in Tri-State Bank. Tri-State Bank was an African-American-owned bank in Memphis, Tennessee. Okay, I have a whole, I have a whole segment, I have a whole presentation called Redistributing the Pain, how African-Americans historically fought back uh, with economic boycotts. And in that presentation, I show you historical examples of us fighting back against white supremacy and racism through various economic withdrawal strategies. Then I show you examples of other people doing the same thing, even if it's divesting your pension fund dollars from gun manufacturers and private prison and, and uh, private prison uh, industry, the private prison industry as well, because a lot of people have their uh, pension fund dollars and 401k dollars invested in privatized prisons and gun manufacturers and don't even know it. This is I'm serious, okay? So. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up there. I know Professor Small is uh, about to come up and present as well. So, uh, Michael Limhotep, founder of the African History Network. I wanna thank everybody for your attention. Be sure to come out and see me at my dinner table out there. Uh, Hotel, Asante Sana, thank you for your attention.